<laughs> so um, next up, I have uh, Steve Shapiro, who I believe is a first-time teller. Are you all right? Let's hear it for another first-time teller. All right. Well, the summer of 1978 did not look promising. I was 14 years old. All my best friends were going away to summer camp, and I had a problem with homesickness. So I had a long, endless lay of days ahead of me that I had to figure out how to fill. And the great thing about being 14 is that, like, if your best friends don't work out, you can always just, like, bring other friends in and, like, turn a new friend into something. And so I had this guy, Mike Miller, and he was a guy that was sort of a friend of my brother's, and he was really different from me, but I needed somebody to hang out with, and so I gravitated towards Mike Miller, and the 78 summer became a summer where every day we were just spending time together. And Miller was like, he was like an overweight guy with glasses, and we had almost nothing in common except that he was also Jewish, but he was like, didn't go to my synagogue, his parents weren't like my parents, they were, um, my parents were like connected to immigrants, like the children of immigrants and professional class. And his parents were like very American and working class. His dad was going between job and job. His parents were divorced, which none of my parents' uh, friends were. And so like we didn't have that much in common, but we needed to hang out. So every day that summer we were spending time together. We'd like ride our bikes to like the Jewish center and he'd hit fly balls and I'd shag them down. Or we'd ride our bike to the root beer stand and we'd get a root beer and it was like, okay, this is cool. And then we'd mostly listen to the radio a lot because um, you know, those were the days of local radio. We listened to like 1520 WINW, you know, we drive by the radio station on our bicycle and I like, think there must be like something cool going on inside that radio station and or like 1060 AM, like we were listening to AM radio. Like, this was happening, you know, was, that was what, where it was. And um, occasionally we'd end up at Miller's house and Miller lived in this really tiny two bedroom house on like a postage stamp sized piece of land right over next to Route 62, next to the highway. And um, when we went over to his house, it was like uh, we would listen to the radio, and one day Miller had this crazy idea. He's like, I know what we should do. He said, let's go up to my brother Alan's room and listen to his stereo. And neither one of us had a stereo, you know, and like this was a big deal, like to be able to listen to a full-length LP, right? So the thing about going up to Alan's room was that we were taking our lives into our own hands because Alan was like an angry kid. He was like three years older than Michael. Things weren't good in his life, and, you know, he had a lot of like rage in him and he only had one place to point the rage and that was at his younger brother Michael. So the idea of like the two of us going up into Alan's room was like really frightening but Michael was pretty sure that his brother was away long enough and that like we could go up there and it would be cool and like I was thinking I don't think I'm going to get killed if I go up there but I'm going to have to watch something really ugly if he shows up and I was just uncomfortable but he said let's do it and so the two of us took the long walk up the narrow set of steps of Alan Miller's cramped second story bedroom. And we got up there and we see the stereo and sitting on top of the stereo is Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run. Okay, now we didn't really know Bruce Springsteen that much. I was 14 years old, Michael was 15, but we had heard Born to Run on the radio when we knew it rocked. We knew it kicked ass and we're like, let's put this on. So we pulled the disc out of the, out of the sleeve and we set it down on the, on the player and Born to Run came, out, Run came on and we danced around the room and we rocked out and we were like, you know, awkward teenagers like outside of our bodies that we didn't know quite how to inhabit right. <laughs> and uh, we were just enjoying ourselves and the song ended and like, we didn't really know any other song on the record, but the next song that came on is called She's the One. And it was, it's, sort of like, um, it's sort of like this rhythmic beat. It's like Bo Diddley squeezed down an off-ramp on the Jersey Turnpike. So it was like African and sexual and like un unbelievable to us. And the two of us are just like wildly, you know, just <laughs> writhing around the room and dancing and like trying to find a rhythm and feeling some kind of sexuality. But like really like the 14 and 15-year-old virgin awkward kids that we were, like chickens with our heads cut off. And we did this like, you know, like it was ecstasy for us. And it was probably happened three times, you know, over the course of the summer. And the fourth time we went up to Alan's room, you know, each time like getting a little bolder and a little bit bolder as we took the long walk up the steps to his stereo, we noticed something that was like shocking, really shocking. And that was that Born to Run, the epic title track of the epic record, one of the great records of all time, was on side B of the record. We're like, holy shit. Born to Run is on side B of the record. Like, what in the hell is on side A of this record? Right? I mean, like, if this is side B, something unimaginable is going to happen. 
So like, we're like freaking out. We flip the record over and we set it down. The first song is called Thunder Road. Neither one of us had ever heard it, right? So we put the record on and we're ready to like rock. We're ready to scream. We're ready to jump around and dance. And we're sure that this is going to be like screaming guitars, banging drums, and we're ready to like really let it have it. And uh, we set the needle down on the record. The thump, the thump. It goes around and we're waiting for everything to happen. Like our bodies are all tense and excited. And what we hear totally shocks us, right? It's, it's, it's a solemn piano and then this lonesome harmonica like this. And then Bruce comes in. The screen door slams, Mary's dress waves. Like a vision, she dances across the porch as the radio plays. Roy Orbison, singing for the lonely, hey, that's me, and I want you only. Don't turn me home again. I just can't face myself alone again. I just can't face myself alone again. We were like, this guy's singing to us. I mean, nobody was moving. It was like silent, and the two of us were like held frozen in this room. I can't face myself alone again. Okay, this was like a pickup song, right? It's a song about a guy trying to get a girl into his car, but it was the 70s and every song was a pickup song, so it wasn't like, okay. But, but you know, this song was different than the other pickup songs because it was, it was honest in a way, right? Uh, Bruce was being honest about himself. He said, um, he said, uh, I ain't no hero. That's understood. All the redemption I can offer is beneath this dirty hood. And then he was honest about the girl too. He said, Show a little faith, there's magic in the night. You ain't a beauty, but hey, you're all right. I'm like, really? I don't think I could pull that off, right? No. But he did that, right? And I, so this was a whole different kind of song. And here was Miller and I, you know, we were spending our summer just passing the time and waiting for something to happen. And uh, Bruce was telling us, he was like speaking to us, and he said, you can't just sit around and wait for life to happen. That's not the way it goes. you got to take it. you got to just make something happen. He said, uh, you can hide beneath your covers and steady your pain, make crosses from your lovers and throw roses in the rain, waste your summer praying in vain for a savior to rise from these streets. And we thought, you know, this is not going to make it happen. He said, roll down the window and let the wind blow back your hair because the night's busting open. And these two lanes can take us anywhere. And that was the promise. This was a four minute and 48 second song that had no chorus. It was just a straight shot down Thunder Road. There was no return. There was no heading back to places you had been before. It was about leaving the past behind, taking the future into your own hand, and heading down a long road. Well, this was like a magical kind of moment for the both of us. And I mean, the, the whole Born to Run, She's the One thing was out the window. And we were just like mesmerized by what this record was telling us. And Miller and I spent the rest of the summer together, and we actually spent the next summer hanging out every, you know, every day together. And we even went to our first Springsteen concert ever together in October. You know, it was October in like the Richfield Coliseum in 1980, like before the river came out. It was amazing, and we didn't know what we were doing, but we were like 16 and 15 years old, and it was like the best thing that ever happened to us. Um, but then after that, sort of Miller graduated the year before me, and he headed off on his own. He joined the military. Um, he traveled the world. And we pretty much lost touch. I never really saw him much anymore. Every once in a while, we'd cross paths or I'd get an email from him out of the blue. But I know that he, he learned a skill. He became like a, a manager of supply chain management and worked for some of America's largest corporations. And he did better than his parents had done. You know, he found and he claimed his own little piece of the American dream. And as for me, uh, I never forgot listening to Thunder Road. I never let that go. And to this day, when when I'm sitting around thinking nothing's happening, I look for what's that possibility, what's available to me. When somebody comes to me and says, hey, why don't you, you want to try this or you want to go for it? Um, or like, want to get on a stage and tell a story for the first time, <laughs> even though you don't really know how to do that. Um, I think about it and I think about rolling down the window and letting the wind blow back what's left of my hair, <laughs> right? And my answer is always the same. I say yes, I say yes, I say yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, Steve Shapiro, I beg to differ. You do know how to tell a story. Thank you for that. That was great. You guys, I'm so proud. (laughs) 